uh, he he read about is because of my students. So first of all, my thanks to all my students who has done fantastic work and implemented lots and lots of things which I have I don't have time to go through, but uh, generally I've been blessed with uh, students on one hand and mentors whom I'm going to talk about as as we go along and their own uh, contribution to what we are talking today as yoga, a practical yoga, a application of yoga in, in uh, uh, different types of uh, problems that we are now doing both at Vyasa and elsewhere. Nimhansa is a center, yoga center also. And so has many other universities now, thanks to Dr. Nagendra from S. Vyasa. And uh, this has become a yoga day yesterday and very popular all over the world. So we have to thank all those uh, teachers who have gone before us and blessed us. And especially, I think I'm blessed with a lot of wonderful people. And I'm going to share this uh, you know, as a memory to their honor and think about them at least on one day of the year, like you know, Father's Day and Mother's Day we have, we talk about it. So uh, I, I want to do that way and come to the spiritual aspects of yoga a little bit later on. Uh, probably I'll, I'll raise some questions. There are no, no answers to these questions. Maybe you will find out your own answers and uh, I don't want too much of a discussion about it. Let's see. Now the title, uh, when Ramajay was asking me about title, I said, okay, I thought about it and said, okay, Akarshana um, Yoga. Now, which means uh, attraction. Yoga of attraction, you can call it, attracting yoga. So kindly don't call me tomorrow morning uh, during my Brahma Murta, which is 6 a.m. This is my Brahma Murta when I get <laughs> And call me, sir, teach me a, 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 a Akashna Yoga because I'm not teaching in yoga and this is not a particular yoga style or type I'm talking about. It's just to say that a, a mystical, as it were, a mis mysterious way that uh, yoga came to me or I went to yoga, whichever way you want. Either yoga attracted me or yoga got attracted to me. It's relative, so it doesn't matter which way you think about it. So that is why I call this Akashna Yoga. Now, looking back in my many years, I'm 84 years old, okay? Uh, started my career in, uh, in IIT Madras, 1972, when I came back from Sweden took up a job as a professor of biomedical engineering. One of the wonderful things happened to me was that uh, word got around Dr. B. Ramamurthy, the, who was a director of uh, uh, neurosciences, uh, neurosurgery and neuro, neurology, and head of the department there in Madras Medical College. This was previous to Apollo effect, as we can call it before Apollo was, uh, had come into the scene of uh, medical care in India, the best doctors were serving in general hospitals. So I knew many of them because we, I was uh, uh, trying to get projects through them and with them and uh, cater to their needs in the biomedical engineering field, interacting with medical doctors. And Dr. Ramamurthy was a very busy man. So he called me one day and said, you want to meet me? And I went and met him. Even meeting him is a fantastic thing. But anyway, I don't want to tell you what happened during that at, the, at the point of meeting. But then he said, he talked to me and said uh, various things. He was very interested in yoga and meditation, which I had no clue about at that time. And he said, we have to do something about it. And uh, anyway, he before that, he said, look, Srinivasan, look at this. He's a, he's a tall man, very good looking man. And look, he, in his probably 50s, mid 50s at that time. I said, look at these hands, he said. I said, yes, sir. See, I have done everything with my hands. Now I want machines to help me. Without machines, I can't go further. And then he gave us a couple of uh, machines, simple things to build to start with. I, I believe he was testing us how, how good we can be. And IAT had no problem in solving some of his problems in mechanical ways of looking at, you know, at what centers in the brain he is doing as he was doing operation on surgical operations on patients. And then he told me he has to work on, I have to work on meditation and find out what's happening during meditation. 
at that time, very little medication research was done. So that, that the only papers were maybe two papers from Ames in New Delhi by Baldev Singh and his group, Chinna Baldev Singh and his group. And I believe that work was done by, done in Dr. Uh, DC Raju's uh, laboratory at Ames at that time. It was at that time, later on, he moved to Nimhans, Dr. T. Desi Raju, a great name in uh, uh, electrophysiology, especially related to the brain. So, uh, so I didn't know quite what to do about it. I said, okay, sir, let me think about it and come back to you. And then we, over the course of uh, a few months, this was about 72, 73, and I met him uh, from time to time, and I was wondering certain things about, uh, you know, epilepsy, for example. And uh, suddenly one day he asked me to come at one o'clock. I went to his, uh, and he said, Srinivasan, uh, I have two boys with epilepsy. I have tried to look at uh, there's nothing wrong with them except that they are getting epileptic fits. Now you have talked about so much, so I'm going to give them in, in your put them in your responsibility. You go upstairs in the ward. I have told the nurse to go and meet them and talk to the students and give instructions to the nurse. And here, here I'm sitting looking at him. What am I supposed to do? I have two beds with two patients epilepsy. To be given to your professor of biomedical engineering in IIT Madras, and he has no background in other than some vague ideas about epilepsy. I said I can't say no to him, and I went upstairs. And meanwhile, he is already instructed. And uh, I looked at the boys, talked to them, and told the nurse, "Look, you know what I think is the brain requires oxygen. There's no other trauma, no injury, no nothing. It's only epilepsy that is manifesting." the brain requires oxygen. So give them oxygen twice a day and report to me. I'll come back after about uh, you know, four days and I'll talk to you. So I'm back to you. Came back after four days, talked to the nurse. She said, sir, I give an oxygen as per, as per instruction and they are not improving. I said, okay, uh, let's, let's try two more days before I report to the chief, Dr. B. Ramamurthy. So when I came back again after two days, no improvement. Now, the point is, my guess was right, but my physiology was wrong. Okay, my guess was right that in some cases, specifically, requirement of oxygen is the primary problem to the brain, and it goes into a fit, as it were, and throws out its electrical pulses. So. But to give oxygen to the brain, it's not easy. It's not possible. And even now, to, we just wrote a little small piece for our uh, Yoga Sudha magazine. I'm just sending it to do to, to, to it tomorrow for publication next month. When you go upside down, when you do, people think, and people keep regularly saying this in meetings, say that if you do Sirasasana or Sarvangasana, oxygen will go to the brain, more blood will go to the brain, more. This is totally wrong. It does not happen. Please be clear. If you, st if you stand upside down, nothing will happen to the brain because the brain is a well-controlled organism. It will not allow more blood to go through. Immediately, the, the lumen, the diameter of the vessels will shrink and not let gravity to take over. It will, it will collapse the arteries a little bit in the brain and no more blood will go than required normally. So that is not the way of increasing blood flow to the brain. So my physiology was wrong. Now let me tell briefly, that, let me answer the question. So what is the right physiology? Now, if you give carbon dioxide to the brain, then more oxygen will go to the brain. Okay. So we had to be very careful about this. If you, if you give carbon dioxide to the brain, somehow, then oxygen will rush into the brain because it does not, brain is very sensitive to carbon dioxide and a, even a whiff, a whiff of little one, one in, inhalation of carbon dioxide will change completely the brain blood flow. Now, we can't be carrying carbon dioxide cylinders and giving it to patients and how much to give is very difficult. And what I would suggest is, I'm not going to tell you details because this must be done in a good clinic with a little bit of control. So, but basically, if you do 
अंतर कुंभ का अभिनीत है उसका it immediately open up the blood vessels to rush in because you know oxygen not sufficient oxygen it increases the blood flow to the brain and when you start breathing properly you, you, your oxygen sudden increase in oxygen and then it will come back to normal values so this is the way to do that and if you want to there's a fantastic book written by i hope all of you have uh, paper and pencil i'm going to tell names and some books uh, written by dr doman d o m a n Doman, D O M A N. He was a psychologist working with a neurophysician in New York, neurosurgery, and uh, they came upon the fact that this is this is what I I learned. This was what I learned after about thirty five years. Suddenly, I came across a book, and fortunately, this book is available in India now. I think maybe Amazon dot com will get you. It's a long title. It says something like. what if your child has uh, add adhd blah 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 okay is that title the important is the author is dr doman d o m a n who has written this book after doing research and after uh, finding out ways of increasing blood flow in children we are talking about 2 year old 1 year old they are not going to hold you hold breath they are not to kumbaka etc and he describes how to do it and as i said i'm not going to do it and uh, kindly refer to the book if you want more details you can call me or send me an email tmsreeni@gmail.com tmsreeni@gmail okay and I'll, i'll give you specifically anyway and they set up a fantastic center in uh, uh, philadelphia which i went and visited that uh, how they really bring forward this Uh, brain affected uh, congenital kids back to almost normal see about those children who come with poor vision they are able to see properly poor hearing poor touch whatever the sensation may be and then putting them back through certain procedures and then bring it back to normal almost normal conditions so it's a really fantastic work they are doing they have been doing last 30 40 years i had a privilege of meeting some of them and talking to them. anyway so i went to the next what happened now as i said at at the, the point of uh, looking at those two <coughs> was the epilepsy my guess was right my physiology i didn't know the physiology was wrong it took me quite a few decades to find out the physiology of breathing and holding breath i went back to dr amurthy told him look i'm not able to help them he said okay forget it i'll take you Then he said, "What happened to him about uh, meditation?" Now his he, he had a, a unusual, you know, his brain is unusual because he was working on brains. So he said, "You know, I said, no, what we should do, sir? Tell me what can I do? We should have a feedback system. What you do is you look at the brain of a meditating subject or a long-term meditator, and we know there are some changes. You take that brain wave and." We do not understand normal people, so they also become great meditators. So do your feedback system, he said. Uh, that that kept me going for about maybe a year or so. How can I do this? Then we came upon a system where we can take the brain wave and uh, manage it properly, amplify it, etc. That keep the waveforms together, like you know, uh, brain waveforms. If you want, you can. take out alpha beta theta delta etc and then give it to i'm just saying vaguely give it to a normal person and see how his brain wave changes now how do we give this wave form we can give it auditory means or through visual means now we went by visual means because it's easier to understand what's happening or it is a little bit more complicated so in the visual means it's the and the subject uh who is receiving this information so i take from the meditator and 
filter out alpha because at that time we were only looking at alpha waves as a predominant waveform, 8 to 14 hertz coming through, filter it out and give it as a flashing light in, in my visual, visual field. Now, again, we tried about three or four uh, different people and uh, three or four subjects receiving the signal. It doesn't seem to do anything. It doesn't really, in, in other words, somebody's brainwave does not make my brainwave change. If at all, if I'm careless, I can even induce uh, cortic epilepsy in patients. So we were careful, but uh, we know it is an IIT. We don't have means of uh, doing something a person gets into cortic epilepsy. So I didn't want to pursue that. So I see, and then we went on to another type of feedback system. That is, I am the subject. I take my brain wave, amplify it, filter it, take the alphas out, and put feed back to myself. Self you know, feedback system. If you do that, then with proper phase of the, of the alpha waves, suddenly you see in one phase it'll lock up and huge alpha waves will come, start up. So that we provided. And then I told Dr. B. Ramurthy and he used it in his clinic for those who were no boys and girls who had you know, young people who have uh, difficulties in concentration, et cetera, maybe this is an aid to them. As well as people with epilepsy, we were able to give some and see there is a modification there. Uh, brain waves. So, uh, thanks to <laughs> Bhira Murthy, several things like this happen. Also, one more thing happened one day. He called me and said, Sir, tomorrow I'm seeing you tomorrow, right? I said, What, sir? I, and, oh, no, you're coming to the interview in uh, Governor's uh, place next year, 6 or 8. There is Governor's place. Come for interview at 9 o'clock. For what? I asked him. Are there is a, we are starting a new institution in uh, yoga research in Tirupati. Uh, we want a director. We want. I want you to be the director. I said. Uh, <clears throat> I said this is going to be a problem because my wife is expecting our second child, and I have to be in Tirupati. And uh, this is not going to happen. I told him, sir, good news. Sir, what? I'm not applied for the post. He said, I don't care. Get a sheet of paper, put your name, and come there. That is your application. I'll take care. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, I have to go there. I went there. And I was selected as a director. <laughs> so we had a wonderful time. Anyway, a lot of things happen. You know, in India, there is a tendency to start something fantastic. And after a year or so, nobody knows what happens to that. No follow up, no nothing. So everything goes, you know, with the wind, gone with the wind, as it were. So unfortunately, we went, we went there was so much of politics in uh, later the institute. I have to come back to IIT and continue my work. Okay, so Dr. Ram Murthy, that was a wonderful, wonderful person to meet and get to know him and the way he was organizing the institute and the way he was getting people to work with him. There is one uh, Dr. Elmer Green in yoga research. You think about Dr. Elmer Green, a good friend of mine from Kansas, Topeka, Kansas. It has the biggest uh, psychiatric hospital in the world, training psychiatric uh, medical doctors. And he was uh, in charge of a psychophysiological lab. And he was visiting in India. And he was coming with a portable EEG lab, polygraph, trying to find out how some people have ability to control some of the so-called autonomic system. Like, for example, temperature. Temperature in two fingers, let us say, if you compare two fingers. And, or take one finger, there's a temperature there. Temperature monitor, you put temperature monitor, look at it how it is. And ask the person to change the temperature by two degrees Celsius, he will change it. Our uh, uh, Sri Himalayan uh, master uh, Rama, he was great at it. He was taken by, he was invited by Elmer Green to come to his lab and then he looked at it and he can change the temperature just like that. There's not, ultimately, he came to the conclusion there's nothing called autonomic in this body. Since there are a lot of people in Nimhans, let me to repeat this. There is nothing called autonomic in the body. In other words, you can, anything you want to control, you can control if you know about it, if you are given information about it. There is a temperature control you want, you give a temperature information. If you want a heart rate, you give the heart rate. Even rats can change heart rate. 
beings, let alone human beings. Human beings can accept hungry. So if anybody has a, a cardiac abnormality, beating, etc., they can simply relax and think about it and reduce heart rate. So the heart rate variability is higher. Okay, I don't want to confuse. So heart rate can be quite under our control, either through direct means or indirect means. Okay, indirect means we'll talk about later on. But directly, there is nothing called autonomic and autonomic nervous system. With you can take even change the pH of blood. Only thing is we don't have continuous access to the information of pH of blood. If we have the information, you can control it. So that was the contribution of Elmer Green. He came here twice. The second time was wonderful. He says, uh, I met him in Kansas before he came. Uh, he was planning. I invited him. Elmer, come to India, and uh, I'll set up an international conference on biomedical engineering. Let us, uh, you'll be the chief, you know, chief guest and the speaker, and the, and the uh, invited speaker, the first one. He looked at me and said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I've done this. I don't want biomedical engineering, nothing. If anything to do with energies in the body, then I can talk about it. He said, and then we looked at each other. He, I knew him very well over the years. I was one of the fam almost like a family member. I said, okay, what are you talking about? He said, I don't know, but energies. Like you say, Kundalini energy. Oh, yeah, okay, talk about prana. Okay, prana. Talk about Then it is, uh, then I talk about it and ultimately came to term energy medicine. Uh, either he said it or I said it. He said, okay, how about international conference in energy medicine? He said, okay. And he came. And the rest of, rest, as he said, is a history. Okay. So he had contributed to look at yoga from a different perspective. With his background, he was looking at not so much of uh, having higher states of consciousness, but higher ability to distinguish things and take care of some of the problems in one's own body. So they had biofeedback clinics all over the world, especially in America, where you go to a biofeedback clinic, there's a, a, what are called, the clinical psychologists used to handle this, I still handle that. And uh, they will put you through procedures where through mentation, by thinking, by doing other things, you can change your heart rate, you, you name it, you can change. So that's very important to understand at what point, to put it mildly, where does consciousness come in here? Where does will come, comes in here? Is will different from consciousness? These questions can be addressed. Uh, by the way, those of you who are interested in consciousness, there are three books written by uh, our good friend, uh, Dr. K. Uh, his name is not here. Uh, Ramakrishna Rao, sir. Ramakrishna Rao, sir. Thank you. Okay, Ramakrishna Rao. Fantastic. He passed away recently, right? I believe so. But he has written one book, especially on consciousness, which is very, very important. It is a wonderful book to read through. It's a thick book. He's written about 300 pages of very, you know, close type. And But he has given every type of consciousness, Buddhist consciousness, Jain consciousness, yogic consciousness, because yogic consciousness has come under a lot of uh, investigation, not today. Uh, 500 years ago, our uh, Swami Ramanuja has talked about it. 2000 years ago, uh, uh, Adi Shankara has talked about it, etc., etc. So it's very important we had to get a real basis what we had talked about when we say consciousness. Because the words in English is totally inadequate. I, I tell my students, the fellow said, what, what, the, what did he say? The second sutra, Chitta Vritti Nirodaha. He didn't say Mano Vritti Nirodaha. Why didn't he say Mano Vritti Nirodaha? Why didn't you say Ahankara Vritti Nirodaha? That was the real problem, Ahankara. But he, he chose the word Chitta because there's a certain connotation to that particular word and this is well defined in Sanskrit. And don't put chitta, don't put mind instead of chitta. If you write my paper and say mind, you will get zero marks. Because it is not. Mind is very, very nebulous term. Nobody understands what it is. Nobody knows what it is because they don't deal with it. They have not dealt with it. Only in the last 50 years, the Western science have opened up to the fact that mind and body has a connection. 
This was told to us by Patanjali thousands of years ago. So we have to make sure that we use the right words. Otherwise, you coin a new word, it's okay. But let them follow up a few Sanskrit words, let the white people uh, take it up. That's all right. We are teaching them something. Let, let us teach them one more word. So it should be Chitta Vritti Vrata. So anyway, Elma Green, coming back to him, he opened up certain aspects of consciousness. He talked about it in several of his uh, talks and uh, visits. And it's very interesting that, <coughs> that we have to think of if you're able to control what you call it, how it, is it a free will yeah, manifestation? What is consciousness in this connection? Okay. Now, another man I would like to pay my, pay my homage to is Dr. K. N. Udupa. He was a director of uh, medical sciences in uh, Benares City University. And he did wonderful work on, on <clears throat> even rats. He thought uh, by putting rats upside down, the physiology, the biochemistry will change. So he, he had written a book about it. Very interesting. Suddenly one day he landed up in my office in IIT. And uh, he said, uh, he offered I should come and work in IIT in, in BHU. Uh, then that is too far away from, from our uh, way of living in Madras and so different. Anyway, he is a... Uh, he is actually an Ayurvedic physician who got FRCP in Canada, came back and set up this uh, integrative medicine long time ago before anybody else has talked about it. And also Yoga Research Center in BHU, which is still doing some good work. So my homage to him also. Okay. So, so far, um, the actual exposure to yoga came only when I start about a couple of things. One is when I came back from US 2002, I was sitting in my home one day and suddenly the, it was past five o'clock and uh, I was alone at home. And suddenly uh, the landline rings. There is no cell phone at that time, landline rings. And I picked it up and said, is that Srinivasan? I said, yes. What are you doing? Well, that's a <laughs> mystery question. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing nothing especially. And he said, why don't you come and visit us and help us out? This was Dr. Nagendra from Eskiasa. And uh, I recognized ultimately his voice. I said, yes, sir, what do you want? I said, come over. Uh, come on, let's see what you can do. And I went over. And, you know, things turned one to another. I started teaching there in Eskiasa. Once a month, I used to go there and uh, talk to students and then PhD guidance, etc. came. And very importantly, I want to say that now the West, West has not defined a life properly. We always think I'm hitting West. You know, I've certain deficiencies in Western thinking. We should not fall prey to that. The West uh, has not defined what life is. Okay? They don't know what life is, that's okay because they don't want to accept so. If you look at it, the psyche, whole definition of psyche, if you go to 1920s dictionary, psyche is, is translated as soul. Now, this is far too uncomfortable for medical professionals, and they take it out and say, psyche means mind. And what is mind? We don't know. Never mind. So, so soul, if you don't bring it in, like in Ayurveda, there is no definition of life. Ayurvedic definition based on as one of the components, this soul should be activated in enlivening this body. They've not done this. Now, death is very important because it's a legal consequence. You can't suddenly say a person is dead and he wakes up. But lo and behold, this has been happening over and over again. In the medical colleges, in medical institutions, with the uh, death being defined as it is and accepted in uh, in a legal framework, still people get up and walk away. So this means, as I was telling one of my friends in the West, to say this means your definition of death is wrong, right? It's not correct. That is why you are you say the person is dead in spite of which the person comes back to life and walks away. There are numerous examples in the, in the 
in the medical institutions where this is happening. If you have any doubts, go to the journal called uh, Near Death Experiences, Near Death Studies, a journal that's been running for 20 years, collecting all this data and putting it together and see when exactly death happens, they do not know. Now, we may be a little better, but not very much. We will say, any, any language in an Indian language will say, prana hoit in Kannada, prana hoit in, in Tamil, prana hoit in Tamil. But what you're doing is now, you're saying prana is gone. So he's dead. Now what is prana? Again, is there a relation to consciousness since you're working in consciousness area? Now, prana may or may not be consciousness. It may not be measurable. We do not know. But now there are instruments, at least one instrument I know of, I'll talk about that now, which seems to relate to Electron flow. Now, this is a very, very important concept to think about. That is, electrons. I am saying is why I am saying this. This, uh, this, this. this has a bearing on health and yogic practices because where there is lack of prana, there is a problem. You have to send prana at that point through some means, either through asana practice, pranayama, or Ayurvedic practice, or uh, kundalini practice, whatever, whatever you have. So that is the idea. So there is, there is a connection. I'm not talking totally unconnected things. So, but this is very important, I think, is to see what exactly has prana to do with physical body. Is it physical? Can I measure it? If it is physical, I should be able to measure it. When not physical, I must have some ways of doing it, like you know, changes in uh, some other parameters related to brand. Now, one important thing came through the work of uh, uh, Sain Gorgai. Sain Gorgai is a Nobel laureate from Hungary who had written a small book called uh, The Question of Cancer, I think it is, a little booklet. And he says there that lack of Ability to give out electrons is death. Lack of electrons is death in a cell. If you are not able to see electrons, moving electrons through the mouth or so, then you can declare that cell is dead. Now, there's a very, very important uh, concept. We need to pursue this because now there's an instrument we can tell you how electrons are behaving inside the body. And these are acupuncture-based instruments. The one I'm talking about is called the uh, uh, Kirlian photography-based system, which is um, also called uh, GDV, uh, gas discharge visualization. Gas discharge visualization. What it does, this is the following. It's a Russian, Russian innovation. Uh, you put your finger, a ta a finger pad on a glass plate, like that, in an enclosed, uh, you know, so that light, external, external light doesn't affect it. And you put a high voltage between the finger and underneath the glass plate, and it draws electrons out of the finger. Okay. And this finger pad, as per Korean acupuncture, has representation along the sector. There are about four or five sectors in each finger pad and each one representing a major organ through the acupuncture system. In other words, when you draw out from a particular sec sector, you know if the kidney is okay, or the liver is okay, or the heart meridian is okay, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So you are able to draw. Now, this has been used, we have, we have done a lot of work in this area at Piazza, about uh, half a dozen PhD students who work with me over the last seven, eight years. And they came out actually at one point, well, maybe three years back, we were the largest producer of paper in this area, technical papers, publishing papers. So not even the manufacturer or the inventor of this device, uh, Dr. Korotkov. Okay, now, most interesting, they did work on three types of papers. One, natural death due to, due to old age in a hospital. Second, accidental death in an accident. Third, suicide. And what they did was the following. They take this instrument, they, they keep the instrument, 
or take it. And uh, as the process of death sets in, they look at what is coming out of the finger pads. You can do, do it for all 10 fingers at the same time in a more sophisticated device or one at a time, which are. So they did this for three, three conditions I mentioned, normal death, suicide, and accident. Now, this is what I don't have charts to show you. I'll just describe what, what they see. In a normal death, power cut. Anyway, we, have, we can survive. In a normal death, for uh, three to four hours, this, see, normally what happens with a normal person, like you take you or me now, alive, normal. The electron availability will go up and down, up and down. This is the way a dynamics of a living system. A living system is dynamic. Like, for example, your heart rate is never constant. If you have a constant heart rate, you better see a doctor immediately. The heart rate will be going up and down a little bit. Well, as you breathe in and out, it is slowly going up and down. When you go up the stairs, it will go up. When you are sleeping, go down. So there is a dynamism in every parameter within the body. Electron flow also coming out of the fingers will go up and down, up and down slowly. But as a normal death comes through, this variation starts going down. Within about three hours, it'll go down to almost zero, but not zero. Because all systems will give electrons. So it will be constant, very, very low values. Whereas normal case, it's up and down, normal death. Now, in both in suicide and in uh, accident death, it is fluctuating to start with. Then when the suicide you know, sets in effects of the fluctuation starts getting more uh, extreme, goes up and down much more for up to 72 hours. And then it goes down to almost zero values. Again, repeat. Now, it is fluctuating <clears throat> after suicide, meet after suicide, as a person is dying, it oscillates huge amounts. And then over 72 hours, then it slowly goes down to zero. Now, I'm not going to explain why 72 hours. You, you make a guess. But the point is that electron availability seems to indicate the life processes. If that be the case, then we can say electrons are equivalent to prana at a microscopic level. Even electrons are microscopic, but still it is microscopic in comparison to prana. So there's an indication, availability of electrons could be an indication of the level of uh, prana or availability of prana for normal health. So if we have instruments, we can pick out independently inside the body this electron availability it'll be a fantastic way of looking at it. the health of every every cell of the body can be found so this is uh, from coming from uh, this uh, Nobel laureate it is really wonderful that we can at least define now define now what is life and maybe what is death based on electron availability and this we have to look into more carefully. Okay, now, I don't know what else to say. Let me, let me say, come back to yoga per se. You know, this is Ashtanga Yoga we are talking about, Patanjali Raja Yoga. Yama and Niyama are the most important first steps in yoga. Yama kinds of Ahimsa, Satya, Asaya, Brahmacharya, Aparigraha. Niyama, Saucha, Santushta, Tapas, Swadhyaya, Isra Parita. Okay. Now, the question arises this is, what is the, these are stages of yoga? Do we have to do this? For example, you take Ahimsa. First, Yama. A classical yogi will say, ah, you must do Yama and Yama, after which you start looking at asana and prana. So you cannot jump into asana pranayama as we normally do. You can do whatever you want in your private life, in public life. To say how many uh, truths or non-truths you can people can assimilate, and then go on to do some yoga and pranayama. No, you have to have every step and perfection. Every step is required. This was some classical people say, like uh, Sri Krishnamacharya would have said. 
He was a great yogi and he could probably do this. But, you know, in practical cases, this is not possible. We ask a person, for example, I've had students in uh, Krishnamachari Yoga Mitra. And they will say, sir, I'm smoking and I do yoga. He's an executive. He wants to get over some stress. He, will, he has a backache. He gets other aches and you know, problems. I was told and I tell my student, look, I don't care about your personal life. You do what you want. But give me half an hour a day. Do this, what I'm telling you, half an hour a day, preferably in the morning at this point of time. Okay? If you do that, and what happens is, after a month or two, he comes back and says, Sir, you know, uh, I've stopped smoking. Is it because of yoga? I tell them, I don't tell them because of yoga, because it needs immediately, you know, my left brain will tell, no, 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 we have to control studies. We have to have 300 people on this side, 200 people on the side, and we have to combine them this way, etc. So, as far as he's concerned, it is because of yoga, maybe. But you tell him, okay, is a good thing happened to you. Please continue doing yoga. Let us see what happens. So, in other words, whatever in this uh, ashtanga somebody is doing, there is a so-called what I call bleeding effect. It bleeds into other areas also because body is not independently suspended from the mind, from the you know other other ankara, whatever you call it, buddhi, ankara, manas. All this is interrelated. So when you start doing one, it gets slowly affecting others also. Ultimately, you become as though you are practicing yoga for a long time. And I had a very interesting case, uh, uh, interesting observation from one of our German friends. Uh, he's a director of a touristic laboratory in Germany. He comes to us uh, uh, during conferences. Like for two weeks ago, there was a conference in Yasa. And he was saying, they had patients coming in, and some of them were willing to do yoga, they teach them yoga. Otherwise, others, they say, no, we are not interested in yoga. Then they do something else, physiotherapy. Now, he found out that those who say yes to yoga, they say, okay, let me try yoga. Their normal brain waves are different from those who say don't want to do yoga. Okay, let me repeat. People are coming to the clinic every day. And they ask the question, you know, this can be resolved with yoga. Do you want to try yoga? Some people say, yes, we'll try yoga. Some people say, no, no, I don't want yoga. Give me something else. Whatever the reasons. Those who say yes have a different brainwave patterns emerging as compared to those who say no. So this is very interesting. Otherwise, those who are already, okay, how, how can this happen? This is what I call pre-genetics. Now everybody is talking about genetics and epigenetics. And nobody is talking about pre-genetics. Now what is pre-genetics? Let us see what is it, genetic. You know what genetic is. I don't want to say anything about it because people are better informed about it sitting there. I don't want to confuse myself. So genetics, you know what it is. So that determines the uh, color of my eyes, maybe color of my telecom, whatever it is, you know, what I choose. <laughs> epigenetics is the environmental influence so that expression of genetics can be changed. In other words, you, you have an environment working through you and it will change the expression. It will not change the genetic material, but it will change the expression of genetics. So that, like for example, a, a, what's it called? A man who is drinking, his, his son or daughter may not drink because she has decided this is not the right way to go. And some ep epigenetics factors have come so that his, uh, the genetic uh, you know, trait can be stopped at that point. Now, this is not enough. This is not explain everything. No, I, I propose there's something called pre-genetics. Actually, in, in uh, layer, let's say in actual terms, pre-genetics would imply vasanas. Vasana is what you have come with. Neither your parents gave it to you, you have given it to yourself over many, many births. And that has come out as a very deep trait in you through your genetic and also involved with this. So unless you control Vasanas, some of this will not come through. 
so you have to be so you have to take into asana how the personality traits are there maybe these people with the different brain waves have different asanas they have done something in the previous life because you know remember arjuna asked this question to krishna to say if i am doing yoga and do, it, do, do not achieve perfection who achieves perfection anyway so he is asking all our questions so if we do not achieve perfection would i have problems would i fail would i will go to you know hell so to say because no 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 don't worry about it if you have taken one step in yoga <coughs> you taken one step in yoga next time you will start taking the second step not the first step yoga prashto avijayate you become you continue your journey you don't suddenly that doesn't stop there the, the next step is coming and it will it will continue whatever you have left off it continues so i keep telling my children my children who have my children or others my colleagues sons and daughters who have sons and daughters and the child three year old child you know what you are doing kindly don't push your ideas into them they should they have to find out themselves you you tell them you put them the right path you advise them but you know what they should do they should remember what they have done before and then continue it they may not remember in actual fact but whatever they continue otherwise how can suddenly a three year old uh, son or a grandson or granddaughter suddenly start singing fantastic where does it come from you should let them do that let them okay it is going to be that is the profession like that to be approached so we remind we have to remind them what they were before and not teach them what what is to, to be taught, to be learned formally or informally but anyway so um, so um, yama the so coming back yama niyama asana pranayama we have to see why as he said asana pranayama do i have to asana first and then pranayama later and dharana and then the dhyana and samadhi is that the sequence we have to go through I will not ask, answer that question. You think about it. Maybe you have a more interesting answer. If I tell you answer, it may not be, uh, you know, appealing to you. You find out your answer. So, anyway, there is a karma which is laid down. It doesn't matter which which aspect you start with, either with asanas or pranayama, which is easiest to easiest to deal with first two, uh, second and the third and fourth, and uh, that will take care of other problems and slowly. a personality change might even come through as we have seen again and again you know in our experiments at vyasa so we have to look, look at it and what is ultimately okay now say only one one more point we will take about 5 10 minutes let me take this asana seems to be crazy actually if you look at it this is very crazy you know people stand upside down twist and turn and do all everything against nature i keep telling my class asana is totally against nature so is pranayama who who has to hold the breath look at the child you know has, have you seen a newborn infant how it is a healthy infant newborn within the first two days three days one month the abdominal go up and down nothing else is moving except the abdomen and it is happy there is a smile on the face and it goes up and down that is perfect breathing no other part of the body is moving that's for us all small side that is nature now we have to hold the breath we have to do something else we have to do bandhas what are we doing we are totally going against and i'm to keep telling every time i fall down from my sarasana i don't do anymore but when i used to fall down god if god has intended me to do sarasana at least you are given in a flat head who is this around head did he, did he ask me and i have gone around asking every mayura hey mayura do you do human asana it says looked at me laughs and said who the hell what silly question who does he human asana we don't want to be human we don't do no asana but we are doing mayura asana this asana that asana all these asanas we now this my need an answer i'll give an answer and we will stop with that it's going against nature and i have written about it somewhere in yoga sutta there is a journal comes out every month called yoga sutta and used to 
every almost every month i was giving a write up like this and i talked about this we are not going against nature but we want to go beyond nature okay there are several reasons why i do asana i don't want to go into details uh, but this particular one i want to emphasize we are not going against nature but we are going beyond nature what does it mean by beyond nature now nature says trigunya vishaya vedani trigunyo bhava arjuna nish trigunya bhava arjuna says gita don't be of three gunas and then he talks he already talked about unatita in second chapter now what is the last uh, sutra in uh, yoga sutra ಗುಣಾನಂ ಪ್ರತಿಪ್ರಸವ ಕೈವಲ್ಯ ಗುಣಾನ ಪ್ರತಿಪ್ರಸವ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಬ್ಸಾರ್ಷನ್ ರಿ ಅಬ್ಸಾರ್ಷನ್ ಪ್ರಸವ ಇಸ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಔಟ್ ಪ್ರತಿಪ್ರಸವ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಕೈವಲ್ಯಂ ಕೈವಲ್ಯಂ ಇಸ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೇವಲ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ನ್ಯಾಚುರಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ವೇರ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ಡ್ ಸೊ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಈಚ್ ಕೈವಲ್ಯಂ ಅ ಟೋಟಲಿ ಗುಣ ಫ್ರೀ that is sattva rajas tamo gunas do, do not manifest in him at all so this is the purpose of doing yoga ultimately to go beyond gunas to go to that spiritual level where sarvatra samadarsina everything is the same there is no difference between one and other because the same thing is which is in me in you in everything else is also in every 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 flower every seed everywhere in nature so that is if you want to call it brahman or whatever it is so this is ultimate level where we see everything with the same eye without passion but with compassion thank you thank you very much sir for the wonderful talk it was a mix of multiple things your own experiences and what attracted you to yoga and how you blended your uh, science or research related experiments with uh, yoga and you also gave many uh, thought provoking ideas to think about and i think definitely we'll think about all these things sir and you have also given many other references some of the books related to consciousness and uh, dr doman's uh, book yeah i think all these things might be definitely useful uh, for the audience over here and now it's open for questions you can uh, it would be better if you put it in the chat box because if multiple people unmute and talk it would be a confusion finally or you can raise your hands put up your hands and uh, then we can let you talk by unmute okay let me only ask the question start with <laughs> uh, yes as you rightly said this yama and niyama which is something very basic and foundation uh, but what is very obvious is it's very easy to start with asanas and pranayamas yes some definitely all of us have some aspects of yama and niyama because of which we of course live <laughs> but how to integrate that for this current generation who don't even any uh, anyway think about all these things it's very tough for them they feel basically can you just give some suggestions in what way we can easily integrate so that it's easily appealing for the younger generations especially yamas and niyamas actually uh, i have not gone through the this uh, overall here there are supposed to be a couple of uh, one chinese student from china she said she will join us i'm not sure <clears throat> they joined anyway uh, she did work on yama uh, niyama with uh, raw college students and uh, in um, up not somewhere let me i forget this now uh, near the state city somewhere there she was working on it and of course her phd thesis may be available for you on internet i think uh, as we asked thesis otherwise there are a couple of papers basically what she did was uh, two or three things one is uh, teaching them telling them at the college level i'm talking uh, because earlier it becomes a little, little difficult when they come to college there are some problems they have problems because 
they're coming away from their homes. Some of them are uh, not well to do. They've come out of their houses. They have to adjust to the rest of the society. They have to adjust to peers who are there, who, are, who may be, some of them may be very rich, some of them may be very poor. So all this com combination are there and they go through a lot of, a lot of stress because they have to pass exams so that they can get some job. And so what she did was to sit with them and give them uh, over a 20 day course, a half an hour talk. More importantly, she picked out a few verses from Bhagavad Gita and they have to write it and write the meaning in Hindi or English. Of course, she can't read uh, Hindi, but basically, if possible, English. And then think about it. And next time they come, is there an impact in their life because what they wrote down? Because writing gives one more dimension for them to remember and try to follow it. And more or less consistently, the things came out that you know, I was aware, I was getting angry or frustrated. So I thought, no, I started breathing deeply and got over frustration. This is not the way to express myself, etc. So it was a very positive response came from a lot of students who are not highly educated, who are under stress, who are from poor backgrounds and uh, willing to and wanting to change. They, they also want, okay, there, is, there may be a problem, let me do this. So we have to go very, very slowly because they are very, you know, impressionable. We should not create bad impression in the sense that they go away from us. Because they are also still in teens, maybe. So, but it is, I think it is possible. That is why you see catching them at the university stage may not be <coughs> appropriate. Maybe a little earlier. Maybe 10 standard, maybe 8 standard. So there, if they are more impressionable, so they may be willing to listen. So that's uh, that's my take on that. That's the way to go about, I think. But I think also they follow what happens at home. If the home has a problem, they reflect the problem. Even arguments. When I had arguments with my wife and we were in America. See, America is very stressful for us, at least. The sense... Four of us, two boys, two boys and myself and my wife. And uh, there's always some, you know, gadabad here and there. So I tell my wife, we don't talk about anything. We'll go at uh, five o'clock, we go for a walk. Then we'll go to the mall. Then you talk whatever you want. I'll talk, I'll respond or other way about. But not in front of, you see, the broken families, there's so many of them, both here and elsewhere. Not only in America, but here also. Broken doesn't mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, people are here. We stay married together in spite of everything. It's also a broke, broken marriage. And there are always problems. There are always financial problems. There are always problems with mother, father, mother-in-law, father-in-law. So many things happen. But if it is expressed in front of children, they get very, you know, very deep down to get a problem. So you have to really work hard with them to take it out. Because this is not a normal they should remember this is not a normal way of expression between a man and a woman, abnormal way. And you can't tell them because if they, they, you don't want to go home and tell them to the parents, hey, you are, you are useless, you are abnormal. So we had to be really very, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, psychology of children. So we had to look at it deeply and work on that. I think earlier will be better about it from about 10th, 12th age, age of 12 or and upwards, may be good. They will understand, they may be able to follow. I don't know if you answered your question, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, much, very much agree with you, sir, definitely, because it's not about whether they can learn or not, but when we need to catch them, I think that's the actual question. Yeah, I do agree with you, sir. Because yeah, we, are trying, we are trying to, yeah, we are trying to catch them at a very later stage where already they have their own notions, all those things, and there we find it really difficult. Yeah, very much agree with you. The genetics have become epigenetics and then there is a problem. So, that uh, lady from Spain asking uh, <coughs> autonomous and uh, did you see the question? Yes, sir. You, yeah, you can pick up the questions and you can answer by yourself if it's okay. Or else you... I don't know where to pick it up. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll, I'll just... There are so many questions, I think. One second. You read it up, otherwise. Yeah. 
those who had actually put up your questions, you can, I think I'll go one by one. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Ravi Mahadevap, I think he has put up his hand. You can unmute and then you can talk. Sure. Um, namaste, uh, Srinivasan, sir. Um, um, uh, this is Ravi. I work as an engineer. Um, uh, sir, my question is, um, uh, nowadays there is, uh, I have worked with artificial intelligence. There has been efforts to uh, uh, copy um, uh, smell, touch, and all. But, uh, the source of all is like consciousness. Has there been any attempt to uh, copy that in an artificial world? Something which I've always been curious, but yeah. I know that uh, MIT Massachusetts has a lab called, uh, basically it's called Touch Lab. It is Touch Lab. <laughs> that is, they uh, give a sense of touch uh, to certain things. So like, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you are cutting a cadaver. Now, okay. cadavers are not available these days for doctors. So it's an artificial system. And, and to give the same type of uh, feeling as a live skin and bone and muscles, etc., they put an artificial intelligence, uh, you know, cover, as it were, so that the person feels as though he is cutting the real body and not a cadaver or a, a, a mock uh, I don't know. See, the, the best person to ask this question is uh, IIT Madras Professor uh, Dr. Manivan. Dr. Manivan. He is okay. working on, been working at MIT also. He's now IIT Madras. He's been working on this uh, touch sensation. And okay. I don't know. How I've seen his lab, but I can't describe to you exactly what he does. But uh, it is possible. Is it necessary? I don't know. It is possible to do that. So whatever we want, we can do. What is the problem? I don't know. So it is changing the. For example, I've always wondered. I'm looking at dead, this stupid dead TV. You know, it doesn't give smell. It doesn't give you smell. You see a beautiful rose on the TV. And you go on, but no smell is coming out. It is not impossible. All you need is what is smell. It is some electrical activity in your in your uh, senses in the nose. You can basically create the electrical you know uh, signals and throw it out from TV. And I sit nearby. I'll smell rose. I don't want to go. Taste so that may be a little bit more dangerous, but at least I just smell. <laughs> All you are doing this is you put a metal strip on top of your tongue, and then the uh, uh, antenna is hanging out, and uh, the TV is sending the signals. So mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in in principle, you can do that. I don't okay. know why. Then of course it's, it means money and so many other factors, but otherwise, we, we can do that. Okay. Okay. That answers. Thanks a lot, Srinivasan, sir. Yeah, uh, there is one more question. So it's not actually a question related to explanation they are asking. You said in your talk, uh, there is nothing actually autonomic and you can control it easily by feedback. Can you talk a little yeah. bit more on that, how to control it and maybe what is the key to understand these things, especially the control part of autonomic? Okay, this is the work of <clears throat> Dr. Elma Green I was talking about. And his wonderful wife, wife Alice Green. Uh, unfortunately, both of them are not with us now. And uh, he's, he's supposed to be the father of biofeedback system, biofeedback. <clears throat> and what he does is the following. I've, I've been to that lab in uh, Kansas, uh, Topeka, Kansas. Take, for example, temperature. Now, you know one of the reasons of uh, migraine headache. You have one, let's say one side or both sides. There is more blood flow and hence slight increase in temperature on one or both sides of the head outside here. Okay, now what is done is you put a little sensor here and amplify the signals and then bring it out in the form of a meter. The meter will have, let us say, the old ones will have a needle moving up and down. Okay. And there is a green portion to the left side and red portion to the right side. So when I put the needle, 
you are just in such a way, it goes to the red side. So meaning that person has, when he, he has a higher blood flow and higher, slightly higher temperature, now tell, it, tell the person, bring it down. What instructions you give? I don't know, you bring it down. Actually, it better not to give instruction because the person will find out the ways to do it. Like, but you can tell, okay, you know, think of, uh, you are from Spain, right? Think of uh, Barcelona, you are going there somewhere. <laughs> I'm talking to a Spanish lady who's talking, who asked the question. Uh, Barcelona, and uh, yeah, you know the uh, playa? Yeah, I'm, I know the playa. Okay, you're walking nicely one evening. <laughs> gentle breeze a lot of people are around talking spanish and you like like the whole atmosphere it's beautiful and relax in this and go deep into it relax fully to see what's happening and as she does it the temperature starts falling goes down to the green area now in the in the, in the process the headache goes away so this is a very simple method but anything else heart rate can be controlled, you can control heart rate. And not you, any animal, they have done the experiments with rats first, not on humans, not he didn't do it. Way back in time, 1930s or 40s, somebody did it in America, where rats can change their heart rate. Not by, so you can change your heart rate by holding your breath. No, they don't do it, directly they do it. So there are other ways of doing it, but they don't know about it. So you can train a rat, okay, rat has a high uh, heart rate, right? 300 or something. Let's say it goes down by 10%. I give a pellet run, who? Oh. You know, within half an hour, one hour, it will find out if somehow it reduces heart rate by so much, it has no percentage, et cetera, but it will reduce heart rate. If something happens, it gets a pellet of food. And then again, something happened, and then you get in the habit, it will reduce the heart rate, go to a little food, take it and come back. And another set of rats, you train them to increase the heart rate to get the food, and they will do it also over a short period within a day or two. So everybody has an ability. Only thing is, we don't know how to present some information. As I said, for example, we take brain waves. It can be changed. Then what is the consequence of it? It's even more interesting because once I change the brain waves, then my personality is going to change, my everything else is going to change because you're talking about the brain. Now, I don't know how much work has gone on in that direction. Maybe that is one of the projects we can take up and see what, what happens. If I change my brain waves, for example, I had a, <clears throat> I didn't tell you, I was a <clears throat> director of yoga research institute in Tripathi for a year, and we had a yogi who comes inside and he says, sir, I can change my brain waves. I say, this is what I was. I can't fully trust him. I said, okay, wire him up. We had the EEG machine, wire him up. And sure enough, he doesn't know alpha, beta, theta, delta, but whatever waveform you want, you tell one, two, three, four, you say, okay, one, three, four, two, one. I go like this. Within a few seconds, that, that waveform will come. So identify one, two, and three, and four, and tell him this is one, this is two, three, four. He identifies us as okay, okay, four. And you know what happened? Actually, National Geographic, Geographic Institute, National Geographic, their team came, and Dr. Ramuji said, take them and wire up that man and tell them how they can change the brainwaves. So I took the team. You know, I'm talking about 1977 or so, where we didn't have video cameras of the of the sophistication we have. They have still cameras, those are rolling cameras, which means it'll make a lot of noise. And uh, he was inside that little air conditioned room. The man was, uh, the yogi was wired up and the uh, camera was running, making a lot of noise inside the room. And he was still, I was sitting next to him and said, one, four, three, one, two, four. You say whatever you want. It'll come within 15 seconds, that waveform will come. So they will totally control. Now, I think we can also control if you are given the chance to do that. Any, so there is no autonomic at all in the body. That's my belief. We can't, we have not proved every one of them, of course. As I said, the pH of blood may be changed. No heart rate variability can be changed. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Heart rate variability can be changed. Anybody wants to explain? Ram Raj, Ram Jai, you want to explain that? Yeah, I think Dr. Ravindra would be the better person. He's basically with. No, listen to me again. Heart rate variability can be changed. Yeah. Explain. Because others may not know. Because I said, heart rate changes, right? As you inhale and exhale, the slight difference in heart rate. It will go up a little bit, go down. When there's a pressure on the heart, as you inhale, it will go down. Heart rate will go down. And then it is slightly more about 1%, 2% changes. You can't look at your pulse and say that is really difficult, but you could with an instrument, you can easily see it. Now that variation is a healthy heart. I know my heart does not vary like that. It is not a healthy heart. But the good, good point is this has been like this for 30 years. So I'm not bothered about it. <laughs> Having a bad heart. So if you don't want, as I said, if you don't want a heart attack, Open up your heart. It is closing. Start loving everybody, including your sister who is looking at me. <laughs> so, start, open up your heart. Then, anyway, heart rate variability. The variability can be changed. And there are feedback systems. Actually, we, we wired up a feedback system for heart rate variability feedback. Anyway, we didn't do any work on it. We had an instrument at one point of time. Okay. So in, in, in effect, yes, anything can be changed within the heart. So for convenience sake, not to confuse the medical doctors, sorry, sir, Ram, sorry, Ramajayam, not to confuse medical doctors, we, we still call it autonomic system. That's all. But it's not correct. The same thing with the uh, uh, homeostasis. It is a wrong terminology that we have been using forever. Even now we use it because nothing is static in your system. Homeostasis is a misnomer. It is not correct. But, you know, uh, it's all right. With the with understanding of its, you know, the way it is used, that's okay. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I'm thank, thank you for that wonderful explanation, sir. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Um, I think it's all more of a comment. Maybe I will uh, give, ask one more question. Last question, if nobody is willing to ask. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, uh, one thing which we very commonly see these days is we are very much obsessed with science, even people who are into yoga. I don't know which one. We are very much, we are, we are very much obsessed with the science, even people yeah. who are into yoga. So, yeah. so, for example, now everyone wants to have a PhD in yoga. Everyone wants to do some research with yoga. Yes, I think it has its own uh, uh, reason also, but... Yeah. Uh, how far do you think uh, we need to blend the science in terms of experiencing yoga as such? And uh, in this context, what is your take? How much we need to really say, for example, if you take uh, research, most of the times we think from a very uh, hardcore science perspective, like RCT, yeah. that too, with the placebo control trial, only when we do, then it is acceptable. But we very well know at the beginning itself, it's not possible to even run a placebo control trial with whether yoga, or meditation, whatever it is. But still, yeah. we are forced to do certain things. So in this context, how much really we need to be scientific and how much we really need to use just only common sense and experience yoga and move on? See, now let me totally generalize your question. Okay, and say, okay, let me put a question in a totally different, the same question, I'll blow it up and see what is ultimately, you are asking question, can we measure Brahman? Can we measure Brahman? That's the ultimate, right? Now, my answer is no. Science will fail. Why? <clears throat> because at least we know the extreme. Let us look at extremes and then we can go little one, one way or another. <clears throat> science measures only changes. Science cannot measure that which is changeless. In other words, you know why I have two fingers? Because they are different. Why I see you? Because you are different from your background. If you totally merge into my background, I can see nothing. 
like you know you hope you appear in a water in a in a bath tub and you have a temperature of water same as atmosphere when you get in the water tub you feel nothing because the temperature is the same so if if you have if you define the thing which is everywhere same amount exactly same thing no changes it doesn't have color it doesn't have properties it doesn't have this and that you cannot measure it period that's done so that is one extreme okay let's not worry about brahman coming down and further down <coughs> now there are systems which measurement may be difficult now if i say electrons are coming from this cell can we measure this no see i have argued that you people say see the science is what is science now people uh, for example many many acharyas and they say yoga is a science you challenge them if you say science what what do you mean by science now i have written about it in my book that um, model etc that, that book i have at, at length i have written about it science has you must understand that science has certain assumptions science is not as though it is above all this blah 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 no if you ask coming back to electrons you ask uh, i asked one of the best scientists from india the best scientist from india physicist sir what is an electron sir you know, asan will you keep quiet his answer sir what is mass sir you know, asan please sit down i know him very well so <laughs> you know it is professor e c g sudarshan who passed away unfortunately a few few years ago and his uh, wife was very close friend of ours in our family family friend in other words he said and then, of course he said that first and then he laughed as he you know i can't you are asking question i can't answer right so sit down he said and then we laughed so even electrons they cannot describe because they know what it is but everything is based on electron you are seeing me because of electrons you are hearing me because of electrons so we know how to manipulate electrons but we do know what it is we do not know what it is i know how to manipulate my teenage son but i know who i don't know who it is who is right what are you saying so the same way we do not know science has its limitations but unfortunately people think science is everything now how do we quantify that is which is subjective that is what the question might be also another question where how how subjectivity can be quantified psychological question is yeah you know they are gray area people don't i myself don't like it it is sometimes okay sometimes not okay and also it is such variable you know yesterday fortunately i slept so well so i am nice to all you guys and my my wife said for very nice to me this morning so i am nice nice to you guys so otherwise if you were to card call me two days ago and ask me to give a talk it would have been uh, you know if you can go and say yeah and me is a good talk but he was not in a good mood <laughs> something like that. so this is variable highly variable how do you try to see at that particular point point you can say okay this is okay so science can only be gray area when it comes to mind chitta ankara all this it can be more specific when you're talking about okay i am i am stretching my muscle how much stress is a stretch compared to some other condition before and after kind of stuff so unfortunately people think science will answer all questions even great people i don't want to name because it will trample somebody's toes great people have said science will uh, will become you know and spirituality will combine no science and spirituality is not going to combine forget it if uh, ramana maharishi have said that i would accept it nobody else can say that because as i said science breaks it down looks at it part by part that is the way science works at least today's science and we are doing the same thing so it has some merit unfortunately i don't think it's going to answer every question for example i asked you guys what is consciousness i am not expecting an answer but you have to answer it to yourself over the next few few years so it is very important where, where does it start where does it is personal does, is there a personal consciousness compared to universal consciousness so 
this has to be first of all philosophically formulated secondly made into way that we can you know give it out to people here take two ounces of consciousness every morning and ultimately <coughs> measure some of these parameters that's why again no what's his name this is jan san gorgi i think it is gorgi who talks about four levels of uh, i have in my book i don't remember exactly of uh, research in medicine anyway biochemical is the third level fourth level is electronic level that they are not even talking about that's what it says and i think it is correct because <clears throat> the whole world the physical world is comprising of electronic variabilities if electron changes its position in an atom from one place to another it becomes totally different if the electron leaves that atom goes somewhere else atom takes some other characteristics so unless you are able to tell okay this electron has gone away because i have done this pranayama then it is good then we are not going to answer the ultimate question but we don't have to worry about ultimate question another maybe 50 years or so i will i'll i'll be there somewhere looking at you guys okay thank you thank you thank you so one, much sir one little one little thing i should have included my well wishes and our well wishes for the whole of yoga dr t deshraju who was with you guys in the mars and i had occasion to meet him several times it was fantastic he was a wonderful person very approachable very nice personality and and it happened that he was looking for his student speech the student was doing phd and rahim he wanted the external examiner he called me and i approved the thesis of course because it's a very good thesis and went back forgot about it and then he passed away i was not in this country i come back after another 4 5 years i meet this student and then the student tells me say i'm i'm using a word student you don't know still he or she the student tells me sir do you remember me i said no i don't think so maybe i have seen you sir you are my external examiner sir for phd thesis with dr raju don't you remember no ma i don't remember you is that shelly shelly tellus yes who has done such remarkable work namaskara to her and to all the fraternity of yoga researchers who have done such great work in yoga thank you thank you thank you very much sir for sharing all this wonderful experiences and answering all of our questions as well uh, again we thank really from the bottom of our heart for uh, sharing your ideas and concepts and uh, thanks once again for all of you so just, you. just a few informations uh, you will be you can join with the same link for tomorrow's session also and the session recordings we will share with all of you we'll uh, keep you updated through may yeah i think dr ravindra wants to tell a few things Oh, uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, and it was a nice experience to listen to you, sir. So a lot of insights. So with your uh, deep uh, experience, and uh, so we thank you very much for all your uh, insights and time that you have uh, given to us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks once again. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.